Thank you. First of all, uh, let me uh, thank uh, Professor Sridharan and uh, uh, the director of uh, NIT Kolkata for uh, thinking of inviting me for this. I must also congratulate uh, NIT Kolkata to be one of the earliest institutions to start uh, a center for Indian knowledge systems. I am sure, uh, as uh, the director rightly said, uh, it should uh, stand on its own merits. I think uh, we should have uh, uh, Indians were always endowed with the power of inquiry. I think we should put it to good use. Namaste, sir. And... Sorry to disturb you, sir. Yes. Not audible, sir. Voice is not audible, sir. Maybe follow from your end, ma'am. We are all able to hear, sir. Is it better now? To join again, then. Otherwise, you can rejoin. Sir, then you are audible. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So uh, I think it is a it is a great opportunity, and uh, I'm sure uh, we will find benefits of uh, our uh, endeavors into Indian knowledge systems, which we have delayed for so many years, and so on. So uh, my interest in Indian knowledge system uh, has been for quite some time, and uh, therefore uh, I will share some of the thoughts and uh, some of the recent things that I gathered while I wrote a book on this topic. So uh, let me start with the right earnest. Uh, I think the first and the most important thing for us is, uh, you know, Indian knowledge system seems to be a flavor of the season now. <laughs> Everybody says Indian knowledge system and there are people who think it is also a political agenda being thrusted on us and so on. I think we need to first clear the ground and understand it. Uh, do we really need Indian knowledge systems and uh, if so, why do we need it and so on. So let me spend a little time uh, on this particular important question and then uh, step into a little bit uh, into some details of what I think uh, could be called as Indian knowledge systems and so on. So uh, the first question that we need to answer for ourselves is uh, what do we do with the Indian wisdom? You know, every society has its own wisdom. And uh, therefore, I think the first most, this is a question for every society. So, you know, every society has its own wisdom gathered over time. So the question is, what do we do with the Indian wisdom? Uh, there are some possibilities. Uh, the first possibility is uh, you can simply abandon them. That's one easy possibility. Uh, saying that these are all not required. Or you can keep it in a puja room. A lot of our scriptures, which are so valuable, are kept in a puja room. And people every day, you know, put some flowers and hardly open and see it. They just keep it in a puja room as though it is a very holy thing. You know, Indian scriptures are men, not meant for caged into a cupboard and, uh, you know, putting flowers every day in the morning and so on. While that can be fine, but that's not its intended purpose. But some people think you can keep it in a puja room and worship. That's all we can do with Indian wisdom. Certain other people think we can take positions without knowing what it contains. You know, uh, you know, some of my colleagues talk about Gita and ask them, have you read Gita? And when they say, no, I say, I am a researcher. I don't talk to you because, you know, I, you know, I don't talk anesthesia. That's not my cup of tea. I should not talk chemical engineering for that matter. I should talk only management because I have read a little bit. So in the same way, Somehow Indian knowledge system has a special license for us. Without knowing it, we can go to the rooftop and say it is all religious, it is nonsense, it is dogmatic, all that. People don't read it. So that's another possibility. You can take positions without knowing what it contains. Or uh, there are a set of people who merely glorify the past. So this is one set of possibilities which I see predominantly happening in the country. But there is another possibility to Indian knowledge systems. And that is to get to know firsthand. I think uh, we should make our own judgment. We should know what it is. We can pick a scripture or two and then deeply go through it and uh, maybe hear a few experts also read for our, for, our, for our own and get to know firsthand what this really contains. I think it is time Indians start doing it. Therefore, uh, that can be a very useful uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, opportunity for us. And one can explore new paradigms. Why not? If we really get to know a little deeper into it, there is a good possibility that uh, we can actually explore some new paradigms also. Now, why, do, why is all this important? Because uh, 
you know, why do we, people ask me, sir, why do you need ancient Indian wisdom? Why can't we do with the wisdom that we have now? The reasons are simple. The issues of business, government and society are as old as rocks and rivers. I mean, the context, uh, you know, on the on the surface, some changes do happen, you know, because of technology, certain issues may get a little amplified. But the fact that people want to be happy, people want to know what is the meaning of life, people want to know how to lead a happy life cannot change. You bring any amount of technology, these questions are not going to change. And how do you manage people? How do you manage a large scale system? All these are not going to change and they existed. So therefore, uh, if it existed for a very long time, the second important point is God blessed our ancestors also with a cauliflower in their heads, as much as you and I have a cauliflower in, a, in our head in the form of a brain. So I am sure they have also thought about issues. They have also addressed issues. So therefore, it may be interesting to understand what they are saying, how they have actually addressed problems which uh, have been always there and how they have addressed it. I don't think one can discount it and say all these are useless and so on. So therefore, because everybody has a cauliflower in their, in their heads. There's a third concept in strategy called path dependence. What it says is the path that you can walk forward is a function of the path that you have walked. You know, if, if I have used my, you know, my statistical background, it's called, a, you know, it's some kind of a, uh, uh, something beyond the Markovian property. You know, you have a random walk and then uh, uh, it transitions happen and so on. Whereas path dependence says what you walk is a function of what you have walked so far. So therefore, it's very important to have a certain continuity of how thoughts have flourished over time. And then one can also ask, why should we reinvent the wheel? There are a lot of ideas which may have been thought about and why can't we look at them? Maybe we'll pick a few ideas here and there. And also uh, the question that we also need to ask, can we progress by doing more the using the same set of paradigms or from time to time we also have to, you know, start uh, with a clean slate, look at uh, certain things once again, go through it and see what it is offering and so on. I think these are all good ideas. And therefore, uh, it's not only about ancient Indian wisdom, it is about ancient wisdom. Every society must sort of, uh, you know, make use of uh, uh, a certain accumulated knowledge that comes over time and therefore it applies very much to us. Before we go further, let me quickly show you some of the snippets. My, my book has so much of details, I may not have time to go into all that. Let's take the Indian metalworking industry. And if you want to really understand Indian metalworking industry, uh, what do we look for? If you read our scriptures, you find plenty of uh, wonderful ideas. I just pop a few ideas here. Look at this. This is a gold coin uh, of Samudra Gupta. You know, it's a third century CE, kept at the British Museum. And alongside that, you see two beautiful uh, earrings. Andhra Pradesh Royal Earrings, which belongs to the first century BCE, which is photographed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art at London, I think. Now, the kind of intricacy that you see here, a metallurgist and a metalworking person will start thinking, what are all the technologies we need? How do you do ore mining? How do you process the metal? How do you shape the metal? Metal working, metal mining, ore working, so many questions will come stamping that particular coin requires a whole gamut of uh, ideas which belongs to uh, what you call it as metalworking. This is a very interesting uh, illustration of what is called downward drift distillation process. The world, India taught this to the world. See zinc, zinc melts, becomes, uh, you know, vaporizes at 500 degrees centigrade. And exactly at 600 degrees centigrade, zinc becomes zinc oxide. So the question was, how do you extract zinc? So Indians, as early as 7th century BC, actually came with a process by which they will melt the metal, they will vaporize it, and then condense it. There are some anthras for it, and then extract the metal. In fact, India was using zinc for 1,400 years ahead of the rest of the world. We actually had a industrial grade production in Rajasthan in, in 13th century CE. So this is a simple illustration of that yantra, which was used for uh, how do you extract zinc uh, before it vaporizes and becomes a zinc oxide. And so just an example I'm just showing here. You might have seen 
you might have read stories of such idols being stolen and taken to Australia and Britain and things of that kind. This manufacturing of these, uh, you know, these uh, 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 idols is done through what is called Maduchishtam, Maduchishta Vidhanam. And in 300, 400 years back, he started using what is called last wax casting process in the West. The process used is uh, the uh, wax of the, you know, the bee, bee wax. And so it's called Maduchishtam. Uchishtam means left out. It's called Maduchishta Vidhanam. Beautiful idols have been manufactured much, much earlier. You will see a lot of Chola brands idols and which are all being smuggled and stolen and all that. This requires a different kind of uh, methodology, which we knew about 600 years ahead of the, uh, you know, the other countries. And we have been uh, making very beautiful very intricate shaped uh, idols and so on. This is a sample set of tools designed by Sushruta using, in fact, Indians are absolutely fabulous in fer ferrous carbon alloys, actually. I, more about it a little bit, I'll talk a little later. But uh, these tools, apparently, which were in the second century BC, can longitudinally split a hair. That is the kind of sharpness and you think about heat treatment, think about extraction, think about alloys which are required and think about, uh, you know, uh, the other metalworking technology you need to you know, fabricate such tools and so on, which you see in Ayurvedic texts, both in Charaka and Sushruta, you will find uh, these kinds of uh, description as early as 2nd century BC. Wood steel, I don't know how many of you are aware of it. There's something called wood steel. Wood steel is used for manufacturing what is called Damascus blades. The entire warfare in the Midwest and the Europe were using steel exported from India, particularly from Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. That's why it is called Mukku. The wood steel it became Eggu, Eggu in Tamil, Mukku in Kannada. It's called, you know, I'm, I'm a, Europeans call it as wood steel. As late as 1920, People have had seminars, metallurgical conferences, in which they are not able to reproduce wood steel. The father of modern material science and metallurgy is wood steel, actually. There are a lot of things about it. You can go and read. Plenty of interest. How did they come with this composition? They are not able to reproduce. Whereas we have been doing it very well. By, by 19th century, beginning of 19th century, the whole thing came to a grinding halt because of certain steps that British took. I'm not going to talk about it now for want of time. A French writer in 1811 says, in ancient times, the Indians excelled in the art of constructing vessels. The English attentive to everything in naval architecture have borrowed from the Hindus many improvements. The Indian vessels unite elegance and utility and are models of patience and fine workmanship. They are very good in shipbuilding. So those kinds of, uh, so this entire page is all about metals and metal working. And unless you have a certain uh, infrastructure and know-how, many of these are not uh, possible, not to speak of the whole basma which are being used in Ayurveda, which is again, you know, extraction of metals like gold and mercury and, uh, you know, uh, copper and all those are being used. Uh, that's not at the industrial grade, but it's the medical applications and so on. Let me get into math, astronomy, and binary numbers, architecture, and so on. This is a typical uh, uh, front view of uh, Kajuraho temples. In fact, Indian architecture had a Dravidian style. There are some textbooks for that. All of them are the 5th century and 7th century CE. You have Maya Matam. You have Samarang and Sutra Dhara, written by King Boja in the 11th century, where you will understand how these uh, Nagara style temples, which are in the north, and the Dravidian temples are described in Maya Matam and those kinds of uh, textbooks. Very elaborate descriptions of designs, uh, you know, uh, uh, patterns, uh, you know, the sort of uh, proportions that you need to have intricate details of how do you actually do construction of a variety of structures and so on. Indian tables were based on accurate observations, some of which were made as early as 4300 BCE. Laplace in 1787 said, I think somebody can, 
Yeah, I find my theory that at the Indian epoch of 3101 years before Christ, the apparent and annual mean motion of Saturn was 12 degrees, 12 minutes, 14 seconds. The Indian table tables make it 12 degrees, 13 minutes and 13 seconds. And then he says the annual and apparent motion of Jupiter at that epoch was precisely as what Indians have said at the Indian astronomy and so on. This is what Laplace said in, you know, 1787. This is called a magical pan-diagonal magic square. It is not a simple magic square. It's a pan-diagonal magic square. What it means is, I have, I have colored the blue color, you see, 13, 16, 4. Imagine this like a cylinder. So if you, if you roll the cylinder, the next number is going to be 1, because that will come to this side. So if you, if you had all of them, it will be 34. It is not only row sum and column sum and diagonal sum. Any diagonal, if you take, it's called pan-diagonal. And in 2nd century BC, and in the 1st century, Nagarjuna has given algorithm for magic diagonals. And in 1495, Narayana Pandita of Kerala, Kerala mathematics, nobody can in the world can come near. I think in Calicut, you must offer a course on Kerala mathematics. Wonderful contributions they have made. The world cannot understand how much contribution they have made. Narayana Pandita in 1495 showed that for a 4 by 4 pan diagonal matrix, there are only 385 or so pan diagonal matrix are possible. Only in 1923, they proved that. But he said it in 1495. So this is an example which I wanted to show. This is a shloka you find in 2nd century BC in Chandashastra, Pingala's Chandashastra. Yamata Rajabana Salagam. These are eight ganas actually. The eight ganas are actually, uh, actually, you know, Yamata actually is one zero zero. Mata Ra is zero zero zero. Ta Raja is zero zero one. Raja Ba is 0, 1, 0. It's like that. This shloka gives what is called a binary cycle. In 1983, computer scientists called De Bruin. It's called De Bruin sequence. So this is a De Bruin sequence for length 3. So you can create a binary cycle of 2 power 3, 8 numbers. It's a cycle. 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 110100 like that it are eight numbers these are all done in fact binary mathematics lot of them has been done by pingala beautiful algorithms are there if you have a 10 digit binary number if you tell the row 10 digit means 2 power 10 rows are there in the array if you tell me the row if you say row is 1783 he has an algorithm to tell you that binary number 000100 whatever it is 10 digit number or any number of digits or if you give a particular binary array, binary number, he has an algorithm to say in which row that number is available. These kinds of things have been done in 2nd century BC. He is the father of binary mathematics. This is a beautiful shloka. I mean, it's difficult to read. Aryabhatta, it's Aryabhatta's words. Maki, bhakki, pakki, dhaki, naki, nyaki, nyaki, and so on. This is nothing but your entire clock's table of odd sign differences. The entire odd sign differences is available in a, in a, in a two-line shloka. If you know the Aryabhatian methodology of numbering, you will get the, the Maki actually means 225. Bhakki means 224 and so on. So entire odd sign table is available in a shloka. Today we use a clock's table to you know keep reading the odd sign differences and so on. So that is what this particular table is. So why bother about Indian knowledge systems? It is not about merely knowing about some ancestral knowledge. Please don't, uh, that is a very simplistic idea. It is about protecting receive the wisdom, protecting economic security. You may say, sir, what does economic security do with the uh, Indian knowledge systems? Let me tell you, the next 100 years is only intellectual property rights. World Intellectual Property Organization will decide who will take away money on some knowledge. So I have given two examples here. An US company was awarded a patent for Neem. We were not able to defend. We lost the case. Why? Because nobody could uh, go to the scriptures and take the text and prove that we know earlier than this US company. Because intellectual property right is all about saying who knew earlier than me. We lost that case. 
whereas when dr mashelkar when he was uh, you know head of csir we were able to fight the case for turmeric and win it this is a small example let me tell you for the next 100 years if you miss indian knowledge systems we will pay patenting for all the knowledge that we have created because we just ignored them therefore i think uh, it is economic security it is national pride it is documenting traditional knowledge a whole variety of reasons why we need indian knowledge system not for just uh, tom toming about uh, whatever answers i think it has a gainful application useful for the society and all that is what i think we should really think about so with this kind of a quick background let's try to understand in simple terms what is this indian knowledge systems okay so there are three parts to this definition the way i have created the first thing is indian so therefore uh, there is uh, by indian we mean indigenous sources of knowledge generated by the indian society and when you say indian society it points to undivided indian subcontinent the modern india is hardly 73 75 years old that's not india that's not indic or indian it is akhanda bharata which starts from parts of iran and goes up to a little bit of uh, even indo i mean thailand on east west of course north uh, south is uh, protected by air and i mean water and uh, mountain so there isn't much of a change in the you know boundary and so on so that is what is called uh, indian then comes the second idea of knowledge knowledge is what which is emanating from the wisdom and insights and mind you they arise out of deep experience they are not dogmatic at all they arise out of deep experiences observation experimentation and analysis validated improved and augmented there is a whole methodology in fact chapter 7 of my book talks about how indians established a mechanism for even valid knowledge pramana shastra how do you make a knowledge valid indians never accepted things that easily so it is not dogma and all that some of them are available as a formal repository of knowledge in literary sources but a lot of them are also available in in oral you know rural and uh, oral traditions and so on and indian knowledge pervades all the three domains we always think indian knowledge is only religious no indian knowledge has spirituality religious and a massive amount of what you may call it a secular knowledge science and engineering mathematics arts painting architecture health whatever you call it so it is not just uh, you know religious the director just now said everybody thinks it is religious it's not there is a whole lot of things available in indian knowledge and by system we mean a, a structured methodology and a classification scheme there are many classification schemes available i will just only show one classification which i thought of Uh, but uh, you know the, the whole knowledge has been so beautifully classified that way that, that's why it is very systematic therefore that is what i call it as indian knowledge system to give a very quick kind of a view so the iks corpus can be looked at like this one chunk is literary which means it is either available on a thala patra which is now converted into a paper and digitized whatever you may call it with the lippy and written down in some ways and so on i call it as literary then you have non literary which has a vast amount of oral traditions which are all part of indian knowledge how can you say they are not part of not part of indian knowledge then in the literary tradition i broadly put it as three sanatan dharma is one big chunk then there are other dharmas buddhist and jain for example then you have a, a, vast amount of regional literature we have you know so many languages and uh, dialects in this country although the constitution today has recognized only 22 languages but there are a thousand of them in this country so there's a wealth of uh, literature in that they are all sometimes very aligned to sanatan uh, dharma and other dharma tradition but available in different uh, languages and things like that in sanatan dharma you have core and others by core i mean religious and spiritual kind of texts there is a chaturdasha vidyasthana 14 part classification called chaturdasha vidyasthana then you have works of several religious uh, leaders philosophers sons mahajanas i mean it's a it's a growing literature then you have 
the vast amount of literature on basic and applied sciences, engineering and technology, alchemy, architecture, aesthetics. Bharata's Nati Shastra is ultimate in aesthetics. Health, wellness and psychology, public administration, the code of living, you have, uh, you know, Subhashita Ratana Bandhakar. A massive amount of accumulated uh, wisdom is all written down in Subhashitas and Niti Shastras and all that kind of uh, things. You have uh, very similar things in Buddhist and Jain also. But the Jain's contribution in mathematics is unparalleled. Phenomenal contribution they have made for mathematics, amongst other things. Buddhists have contributed for ship building, uh, ideas, those kinds of things are there. Mathematics also, you know. In fact, I must tell you, Gautama Buddha, when he was uh, interviewed, um, Swayambara, I mean, what I meant was Swayambara, he married, only then he became Buddha. When he married, he was, uh, the Swayambara was conducted by a person who asked him to tell a number up to 10 power 57. It's called Tallakshana. So, Buddha apparently reeled out all the numbers up to 10 power 57. Then he told uh, that person, Sir, I will tell you one thing. We have a system of counting. He gave a complex formula. He said, put n equal to 0, you get 10 power 57. You put n equal to 1, you get 10 power 99. It, it goes in steps of 47. Uh, there is a formula. I mean, I don't readily remember the formula. And Buddha said, at the ninth counting level, which is n equal to 8, you will get a number called 10 power 421. And Buddha is saying it some 2800 years back. My dear friends, you have to ask, why do somebody need a 10 power 421? Today we need a biggest number, as far as I know, we need in India is what, what I call as A Raja index of corruption, some 10 power 13 or something. 1.3 to 10 power 13. That's all, 130 lakh crore, some numbers are, you know, Avagadro numbers, some 10 power 23. We don't need bigger numbers. In fact, uh, Romans cannot write bigger numbers. If you have to write 1 crore, you have to put M 1 million times. Because there is no number bigger than M for them. M is 1000. Whereas Indians' contribution to the world was place value system. I have a chapter where I exclusively have discussed only on numbers and measurement systems Indians discovered some 2000, 4000 years back. Anyway, so these kinds of contributions are there. And that is how one can look at. So I will now, again, take a few specific examples here and there and show you some snippets of Indian knowledge systems, the way it is appealing to engineering students. So there is this great language called Sanskrit. Panini, who lived about 2,800 years back, came up with a set of some 3,983 rules. That's all. You can manufacture any word. In fact, Sanskrit dictionary is of no use, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, because my words are manufactured. Now, this is a logic. I mean, Panini did not use this logic. I'm telling you how to manufacture a word. For example, Ramah, Ramo, Rama. In fact, in my book, I have actually given a derivation of how did it come. It is, you know, in entire Sanskrit language is algorithmic. So you read inputs for the operations to be performed. You take Ram and then add something. And you want to know if you add something to Ram, what will happen? Then this, this uh, 3,983 rules will be kicked off. So I equal to I plus 1. Is I greater than 3,93? No. Then read that particular I sutra. See whether this sutra is applicable. If it is applicable, transform that Ram into something. Then I equal to I plus 1. Keep on, you know, I equal to 0 again start. I mean, it's a, it's a you know, uh, inefficient algorithm, you can write a better algorithm. I'm only trying to explain what it is. So if three, if after 3,983 rules cannot be applied, you come to an end, that will be a valid word. This is how Panini's uh, Ashtadhyayi is all about. I mean, this is one way to understand. So in Sanskrit, words have a root. Words, any word can be derived. Words are modular. There is a prefix and a suffix. You can actually put them and apply rules and manufacture the word finally. Very logical, very algorithmic in, in his thinking from 2,800 years back. Just imagine. Now so there is something called samasa, compound words. And any compound word in Sanskrit can be actually manufactured through a recursive logic. If you have put n number of words and make one compound word, 
samasa. Then, and I'm not going to explain the logic. I am only saying there is something called Purva Pada and Uttara Pada. So you take a Purva Pada, add the next, combine it and make a Uttara Pada. Replace the Purva Pada with the new Uttara Pada. Take the next word and keep It's a simple recursive logic. And one can use the recursive logic and when the do loop ends, you will get the word. I'm not joking. This is an example here. I, I will just show you. There is one Sanskrit word called Nana Chitra Garodarastita Mahadipa Prabhabhasam. It's a single word. So I have taken a part of it and I, you know, I can show, I'm not going to again go through it. I just wanted to show you. Deepa is a lamp, Stita is place, Udara is belly, Gata is a pot, Nana Chidra is peers in multiple places. So you have to combine all these words into a single word and the recursive logic will work. And you can say, start with Nana Chidra, then add the Gata, then add the Udara, then add the stita, then add the deepa, the logical end, and you will get the word called nana chitra gado stita deepa. This is how words can be actually manufactured. So it is a simple recursive logic. And if you understand the logic, complex words become extremely simpler. Sanskrit is actually a very simple language. If you are a logically bent person, Sanskrit is the most uh, adaptive language for people who are logically oriented and so on. So our engineers, we want to improve their logic, teach them Ashtadhyayi one course, they will beautifully pick up their logic, they'll understand these nuances of logic. This is called Sena Chiti. You know, we were doing in Sulba Sutra. Sulba means thread. This is again Vedic times. They do a lot of yajnas and the shape of the altar, there are 78 different shapes of altars. This is called a flying kite or a falcon. Now here, there are exact, this cannot be done simply. See, there are five shapes here. I have color coded it. There's a square, there is a right angle triangle, there is an isosceles triangle, there is a sort of a trapezium, and there is another sort of a, a rectangle and a triangle on the top of it. And I, I have designated as B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, five different types of bricks. They have to be manufactured in this particular format. Exactly 200 bricks must be used to actually construct this. So don't think this is a very casual idea. Is that there's a lot of cyclical geometry. The entire Sulba Sutra is all about cyclical geometry. This is a very good elective to be offered. In, in, Canada, in Canada, in Canada and USA, there are offering, offering this as an elective. It's called rope geometry. Sulba means rope. So construction, how do you get complex shapes? Because the ancient Indians had only a stick. They can tie a thread to the stick. And if you tie a stick, uh, thread to a stick, the only shape you can generate is a circle. So any shape they will get with a cyclic geometry. That's why it's called cyclic geometry. You can use circles and construct any shape you want. There is a way to do it. So that is being taught in some places in Canada and US. That, so this is being done like that. Exactly 200 bricks of these numbers, these shapes, put together it will form a Sena Chiti. There are 78 different shapes like that. In fact, Indians found the value of pi in Vedic time. Why? Because there is something called Gargapatya and Ahavaniya. One is a circular one, another is a square one. The requirement is the area must be same. If, if Gargapatya and Ahavaniya must have the same area, without pi you cannot solve. You have to now say pi r square is equal to a square. Only that way you can say that the area of a circle is equal to the area of a square. That was the requirement for constructing those altars actually. So this is an example. This is called Varna Meru, Varna Prastara. This is what Pingala says in 2nd century BCE. We are now taught, this is called Pascal Triangle. We are now taught this as Pascal Triangle. Actually, these are all found in Chandra Shastra. It's called Varna Meru. And there is a construction algorithm for this. You can go any deep. Simple methods by which you can get the Pascal, Pascal Triangle actually. He called it as Varna Prastara. And he gives an algorithm for constructing this triangle and uh, you know things of that kind. This is in second century BC in Chandra Shastra. This is uh, the planetary revolutions in a Mahayuga, and uh, uh, the inferred. It's a little technical, so I'm not going to get into so much detail. Inferred sidereal periods as per Aryabhatiya, and look at uh, the modern value and Aryabhatiya's uh, calculations and you will find uh, you know they are almost same to the four five six digits they are all common 
because that is the kind of uh, excellence we had in astronomy. So the modern value and the, uh, in fact, this 577, 53336. Do you know how Indians remember that number? This number is called, there is a beautiful uh, Katapayati formula. It is called uh, Maha Raja Raja some, uh, something. I, I have to check my book. I am not able to offline remember. That 577, 53, 336 is a beautiful word. And if you know the word, you deconstruct this number. This is how our texts are. Our numbering system, handling large numbers were some done so creatively. So mathematics is not right brain anymore. For Indians, mathematics was both left brain and right brain because you have to be aesthetical, you have to be artistic, you have to be poetic, and you have to be mathematical. That's how you'll find if you read the ancient Indian mathematical texts and so on. So this right brain, left brain are all recent making. It is both the brains in equal measure. Uh, this is a very celebrated text called Rasaratna Samuchaya. It's an 11th century text. Uh, and uh, this text has very elaborately talked about the ferrous carbon steel alloy. You may be wondering why do you need it? Because in Ayur, Ayurveda, there's a lot of ore mining and ore processing. Therefore, they had a good amount of uh, understanding of uh, uh, you know, iron carbon alloys. So he has three classifications, Kantaloha, Tikshnaloha, and Mundaloha. Cast iron, carbon steel, and soft iron. And within, these are all shlokas there. You know, uh, you have, for example, Kantaloka, there are five of them. It's called Bhamaka, Chumbaka, Karshaka, Dravaka, Romaka, and so on. And properties are all mentioned. How are they, and so on. So. Look at the kind of thinking that has happened in 10th century, 11th century CE, in which uh, we our, our metalworking prowess, our metalworking applications, our metalworking technology had left the world behind. If you read these scriptures and understand what they are saying, we are able to get that impression actually. Now, dyes, paints and perfumes technology, if you take, for example. You know, they say Ajanta paintings are not fading. You go to a place in Sri Lanka where there is this, uh, you know, caves on the top of the hill where there are again paintings. You Ellora paintings, Ajanta paintings are 2,500 years plus. They are not fading. Now, if you ask why, you find answers in our Puranas and in some of our scriptures. For example, you have uh, what is called, uh, you know, Vishnu Dharmotra Purana, it is a Upa Purana actually. And it discusses about different aspects of uh, painting. There's a, there's a wonderful lady by name Stella Krimshrich. In 1930, she came to Calcutta and written a beautiful book on this Vishnu Dharmotra Purana, where she has discussed in great detail this uh, painting technology and all that. Vatsi Aina in his Kama Sutra has talked uh, quite a bit about this painting, how to do and you know ideas are there. In chapter 40 of Vishnu Dharmotha Purana, you find how do you create, prepare a wall for painting. There is something called Vajra Lepa. How do you actually manufacture a Vajra Lepa? They are all available in more than one scripture. I am just talking about only Vishnu Dharmotra here. 64th chapter in the second kanda has 46 verses in which the issue of perfumes is discussed. You know, different, different kind of perfumes. How do you actually use the ingredients and create those perfumes and so on? And Varaha Migra's Brihas Samhita, which is a very celebrated text in the 5th century CE, he has a 77th chapter called Gandha Yukti. And if you want to give your students good problems on permutation combination, you will find in this chapter. He says there are four ingredients, four proportions in which you can mix it, how many different perfumes you can make. And then he comes up with 174, 720 different perfumes that you can create. All those are described in those uh, 37 verses in that chapter 16, uh, so chapter 77 of Gandha Yukti. So uh, I think Varahamira also talks about Vajra Lepa. How do you prepare a wall for painting and so on? So paints, dyes, perfumes, technology, all those you can see references. Details, references, not just passing references. There are details of how do you do it? Now, this Vastu Shastra, see today, 
there are two two sciences which have been destroyed one is vastu another is called jyotisha they have created it uh, in such a way that everybody thinks that these are all witchcraft they are very good sciences actually they are not you know today's vastu people come and say keep your uh, you know bedroom here keep your toilet here and all that's not vastu shastra that is uh, reducing it it is like using sandalwood for cooking our breakfast that's what is happening you should not use sandalwood for cooking breakfast so that is what is happening in the name of using vastu so let me tell you what is covered in vastu you can read any vastu book you will find vastu books talk about town planning there are land use patterns discussed how do you design towns and villages and capital city how do you do site selection for building the capital city and so on how do you do site selection this is one aspect of vastu the second aspect of vastu is civil very good descriptions on different types of five story seven story eight story 12 story temples palaces with 40 rooms and 20 rooms very good designs are being discussed our architecture students must read all these properly they must be taught palaces houses forts public buildings like theater library you know chikitsa uh, shala medical infra other public infrastructure horse stable everything how do you do it furnitures artistic things how do you manufacture all those details are available temple architecture different types of temples components of a temple if people understand iconography which is there in vastu shastra we will advance our textile technology and ready made manufacture i am telling you because there are only five humanoids for male and five humanoids for female given and they say that's the gold standard so with that you can actually build ready made shirts and uh, pants everything for people if you read the iconography properly so our textile technology must read iconography all those are available in vastu then as i told you artistic things are being described paintings furniture and doors sculptures how do you do all that kind of things are being discussed and qualification of the architect stapati vartaki there are four five subordinates how you select them what are their skills there are chapters which discuss about what uh, ought to be done choice of building material wood etc and there is a beautiful concept called vastu purusha mandala how do you lay out how do you look at the top view and then how do you lay out your infrastructure using some principles and so on so this is called a vastu purusha mandala i have taken again this stella kramshej has written a beautiful book called the hindu temples in 1930 she came and researched it's an authentic book called hindu temple from which i have taken this vastu purusha mandala how do you do a top view how do you lay out different different uh, you know uh, facilities either in a house or in a city or in a village all those uh, you know there are 9 by 9 grid there's a 18 by 18 grid there's a 10 by 10 grid there's a 6 by 6 grid different designs are available so there are eight different villages being talked this is one type of a village as you see here there are zoning where do you keep shops today the biggest problem in india is residential layout has commercial residential layout also has uh, software shops uh, you know busy bazaar everything whereas they have a particular way there are 12 gates to get into this city and uh, different things are laid out even arthashastra talks about it second century bc arthashastra talks about town planning uh, ideas in great detail in book 2 of arthashastra so i will quickly i conclude here arthashastra the entire arthashastra is based on seven principles sapta prakriti is what they call the seven elements which make a state the king the amatya the minister the janapada the territory the durga the fortified capital the kosha which is the treasury the army which is the danda and the ali which is the mitra so the entire arthashastra talks about is organized on these seven topics you can see the equivalent of that in business management the king is the owner of of the company equivalent the ministers are the key for cxos in any company markets and stakeholders are actually the janapada 
fortified capital or the strategic barriers any organization has. Finances, of course, is the treasury. Controls and processes, that is called danda. Checks and balances, controls and processes. And collaborators are actually ID. There is an equivalent of what he says in modern business management. And there are, you know, as I told you, all these form these components actually. So what do you find in Arthashastra is not something some 2005 year old idea. If you can understand and then relate it to the modern day corporation, we can actually borrow a number of ideas from all these and incorporate it into our thinking and pick up some very good ideas of special interest in Arthashastra is foreign policy. Because that is what Kautilya's specialty. So he has six methods of territorial expansion. Samadhi, Vigraha, Asana, Yana, Samshaya, and Dwaidi Bhava. There are six methods. Let me tell you, if you have to teach market expansion in business management context, market expansion, then some of these ideas are very useful. How can we increase the market share? How do we negotiate with potential collaborators, deal with competitors, and when and when not to plan for a new market entry? That is called Yana or you know, samshaya, when do you not do anything, when do you do something, all these he discusses. And what is the value of multiple joint ventures and alliances? He has a concept called circle of kings. There are 12 circle of kings he talks about. He says that's so how you have to make your alliances. So all these are not uh, just some weird ideas. They can be thought through very well, but to think through all of them, first we should know what it is. Without knowing what it is, what can we do? Therefore, I think we have to dip into this corpus and get to know what is going on there, then we can actually find ways by which we can make use of it and do whatever we want to do. So I just wanted to give a little quick sort of a overview of how things are organized, what are some of the topics that you have and so on. So I, let me conclude it by saying we have written a book, three of us. Uh, myself and Vinayak Rajat Bhatt and Nagendra Pavana, who, in fact, the three of us thought about it in Chinmay Oshudhya Peet. We offered this Indian knowledge system course there. That's when this thought slowly started and it culminated. Of course, there were background for all the, the other two are great Sanskrit scholars. Uh, so, you know, we got together and uh, we wrote this book. This book has 14 chapters on Indian knowledge systems. What, why and how of all those are mentioned there. I pulled a few ideas only from that book. Extensive original quotes in the form of uh, end notes. We have actually quoted uh, from Briga Samhita, Yukti Kalpaturu, Samaranga Sutradhana, Maya Mata. Otherwise, there is no authenticity. You can't simply talk something and go. But uh, those who are interested can read it. So we have put it in the end note rather than putting it in the middle of the chapter because so for some people it may be a little difficult to read and so on. Certainly, it's first of its kind in India. I don't think anybody has attempted a book on Indian oil system. We have thought about it. We have done it. I hope uh, people would, uh, you know, really uh, be happy to look at that. Actually, this book is organized like this. The part one talks about Indian knowledge system. In 100 pages, we, very quickly, we actually introduce some important things. Then, the rest are all only applications. The concept is just the front part. Uh, I mean, the Indian knowledge per se. The rest are all on uh, real applications. The second part is about foundational concepts because our ancestors had very foundational ideas to build a massive infrastructure called science, engineering, and technology. They talked about linguistics and phonetics, algorithmic approaches, language, a way by which you can think of very large numbers, where you can remember numbers and binary numbers and those kinds of things. How do you create knowledge? How do you make sure the knowledge is valid? Nobody should get away with you know, deductive logic, inductive logic, all those they have thought about. So the second part talks about it. The third part talks about science, engineering, technology, and Indian knowledge systems, mathematics, astronomy, engineering, technology, and metals working, engineering, technology, and you know, uh, uh, dyes, perfumes, irrigation, watershed management, so many things are there. And then town planning and architecture, then we have the last part, which talks about health, wellness, and psychology, and governance and public administration. So this is how this book is organized. I'm sure uh, some of you may find it uh, very interesting. Since there are quite a few professors who may have an interest in teaching, I also want to a little bit talk about some of the 
things that we have to be careful when we dip into Indian knowledge systems and we want to teach it and so on. So what are some of the challenges in unlocking this treasure? This is an issue in which I want to, because on my own personal experience, I want to share some of these thoughts. The first challenge is uh, you cannot open a simply a traditional work and read and say teach financial management or metal working. It's just not going to work because they, there's a different way they present it. So unless we actually understand it, unless we understand it from that lens, we may say all this doesn't make sense and they are all laughable and all that. Uh, we will just throw it off actually. Because the presentation methodology is very unique. It's completely alien to us. We are all in a Macaulayan system. We have not been taught the way we ought to be taught. And therefore, this literature we can't read now. So we have to you know, get back somehow to this methodology of under. It is presented in a particular way. So we have lost that touch actually. We cannot decipher the content with a pure logical mind, which is the Western approach. Analytical tools are useful only up to a point. You have to be a little more synthetic in your mind. And in fact, that training will come when we read actually Indian knowledge systems. We'll become very synthetic in our mind. We'll synthesize a lot of ideas. So these are some of the uh, basic challenges that we will face. In terms of uh, some of the pitfalls that we need to avoid, because I have seen people attempting teaching Indian knowledge systems in different versions. I've been teaching for the last 10 years. Bhagavad Gita is a very successful elective in IAM Bangalore. 200 plus students take it for the last eight, nine years. I've been actually offering this elective. I've seen people trying, so let me share some of the pitfalls that we have to be careful. The first and the most important thing is ignorant teaching is more damaging than no teaching. This is a problem with IKS. People simply take something and then throws into the class and they are not able to go one step forward. If students ask some question, we don't know how to actually answer it. I think we need to invest. The point I'm making is we should have a Shraddha. We should genuinely, for the sake of the society and the country, we, so a few faculty can invest a few years, we will be on our way. We should teach properly. Ignorant teaching is more damaging than no teaching. This is the first problem that we need to avoid. The second, two generic and sweeping conclusions people try to do. See, there is one shloka in Bhagavad Gita, Matta Parataram Na Anyat Kinchidasti Dhananjaya, Mai Sarvamitam Protam Sutre Manigana Iva. It's a seventh shloka in chapter seven. I have seen people saying this is Gita and string theory. To me, this is too much. We should not do such things. Just because it says there is a thread in which the whole you know, world is weaved into it, like different beads of different sizes and colors, that's not string theory. String theory is a complex math. I, they have attempted a few things to actually talk about. So I think people try to do it. We should avoid. We should present it as it is and leave it, rather than trying to make all these kinds of uh, unnecessary uh, you know sweeping and general conclusions using old knowledge to explain what is already practiced today again there is this tension and there is this pressure on people to say oh indian knowledge system has all these don't worry we don't have to do all that i think we are simply present we simply say what is there and leave it in the book we have tried to as far as possible do that we have just said these are all what is contained there maybe some of them are useful some of them are interesting and so on so that is what uh, it is. I think we should not try to glorify the past. And trying to use foreign translations of Indic knowledge is not at all authentic. This is one of the biggest trap that we will fall into. There is a very famous Dutch scholar called Kaland. He translated Shatapata Brahmana. In my book, I have given a box in which I explained that. He has translated Shatapata Brahmana and one mantra he says, the earth is separated from the heavenly bodies by stacking 100 cows one over the other. Anybody who reads such a translation will ridicule Indian knowledge and throw it into the drain. Because they don't know that the mantra says Shata Gavaha. Shata Gavaha is Gava. Gava means cow is only one meaning. If you look at, uh, you know, uh, Nigantu, which is the Vedic dictionary, Thesaurus, there are 38 meanings for go. One of them is earth itself. So the distance between sun and the diameter to distance ratio between sun and earth is 108. That's what the Shatapata Brahmana is saying. It is moved away 100 times, which means the ratio is it's 100 times the diameter. That's what it is actually trying to say. And he says 100 cows stacked one over the other. I have seen plenty of such uh, bad translations, including Max Muller and all these. So you have to be a little careful about using because they have honestly, they have not lived in this culture. Language preserves a lot of culture. 
so unless you are lived in that culture you sometimes it's difficult to transfer we have to be a little careful about it and that's therefore the other issue is excessive reliance of using translated work please don't give me a black and white uh, uh, painting of raja ravi verma i want to see it in original black and white is only substance no spirit so uh, the translated work is like a photocopy of a raja ravi verma's painting so you have to use it only up to a point we must invest on reading our original text initially it may be a little difficult but then we'll enjoy it after some time so these are some of the things that we need to be a little careful i thought i will share this and finally i'll end with why we are in such a mess today and we have to make so much effort in india to introduce indian knowledge system i mean this looks very strange in india you have to make effort to introduce what is called indian knowledge system after 75 years of independence because we are almost celebrating 200 years in another 13 years we'll get we'll celebrate 200 years of macaulay and educational system i have just quoted a few texts you know i have just taken a few statements from a note he wrote to queen victoria and this is architect of current educate system has this opinion about india the dialects commonly spoken among the natives of this part of india contain neither literary nor scientific information and are more so over so poor and rude that until they are enriched from some other quarter it will not be easy to translate any valuable work into them and then he says goes on to say a single shelf of a good european library was worth the whole native literature of india and arabia this is a challenge to every indian today that a single shelf in european library is far more valuable than arya bhatia and all that i talked about talked about no i believe no exaggeration to say all the historical information which has been collected from all the books written in sanskrit language is less valuable than what may be found in the most paltry abridgments used at preparatory schools in england so again these are the challenges but then a person who have this view is the father of the education system that you and all all of us have gone through and are going through now therefore i am not surprised that we need to make enormous effort to bring indian knowledge system into the mainstream i think with this thought i will leave it here maybe we can spend a few minutes if there is anything to discuss we can do that thank you very much